So I'm Kelsey. I um, have been doing digital art for oof, uh, over 10 years. Um, and I was a studio art major at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, uh, primarily with traditional art. So most of my digital art is self-taught. Uh, today, I will be going over Krita and a little bit with Photoshop, as previously mentioned. Uh, what I am drawing on today is a Wacom bamboo tablet. It is very old. It is also 10 years old. It still works, so you know. Um, obviously, there are a lot better options out there today, including ones that you can actually see what you're drawing. So, and then this is my, yes, it's held together by tape. Uh, this is my stylus. We have an eraser. We have uh, a pen. Technically, these are two brushes. Uh, as far as digital art is concerned, the eraser is noticeably different to the computer, so it will actually erase when I flip it over, which is nice. Right. So let's talk about digital drawing. Um, so Krita is a uh, free program. It is it was developed by Katie as part of the open software, open source software movement. Um, you can get it online from krita.org. It is also available uh, from the Windows Store, Steam, a couple other places, but for those it's usually uh, cost money. Um, but you just want to get it off the website. Uh, it's not currently available on iOS and iPad OS, but the Android version is in beta and hopefully we will have it on iOS and iPad OS soon. Uh, I'm going to be doing this. I'm using a MacBook for this. Windows works too. Uh, you'll want Windows 10 though. All right. So let's see. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So we are going to start. So this is Krita's opening screen. We're going to start with creating a new file. Um, and so the nice thing about Krita is it was basically designed to have absolutely everything. Um, anything and everything you can think of. So you can animate in Krita, you can do comic templates, there's design templates, uh, DSLR templates, texture. I'm gonna make a custom uh, document today. However, if you have a document that you're already working on, you can always create from clip, uh, the clipboard as well. So over here in custom document, um, so this just has uh, image size, which is the dimensions of your canvas. So I'm going to switch it over to inches just so that makes a bit more sense. So here we have a fairly small canvas. It is four by inches by five inches and the resolution is 200%. Uh, the resolution is picture, pixels per inch. 200% uh, is actually a little bit low. Usually if you are doing digital art, you'll probably be wanting to work at 300. Uh, the lowest you really want to go is 72, and even at 72, it'll start looking pretty blocky. You can go higher. However, the thing you need to remember is, is that the higher the resolution is, the bigger the file is going to be. So you might experience slowdowns if you go past, um, if you start doing 700 or 1000. Uh, same thing for canvas. Uh, the bigger the canvas, the bigger the file. Uh, that can be really useful if you are doing a lot of detail work. You might want to work with a very large canvas. But since we are on Zoom and Krita does not always like Zoom very much, I'm going to go with something fairly small. And then we also have right here, we have content, the second tab. Now, this one is really just you can name your file before you even start. Uh, th it tells you how many layers you have, so that includes the background and then the, what the background color will be. So I have this neutral gray. Usually it defaults to white, um, but this works. So that's what I'm taking, I'm, I'm doing. And so then I'm just going to hit create. And there's actually a little summary right here at the bottom that says the document will be 800 pixels by 1000 pixels uh, and so on and so forth. And it tells you how much space it will take up. All right, so we're going to create that. Uh, so this is the window that uh, I have currently set up. If you open Krita for the first time, it might not look like this. Um, that is because you get different workspace options. 
So if you want to change what workspace you're using, you will go up to the top at window, and then you will go down to workspace. And then there are all of these options. Now you can also change them individually to fit what you like, um, but different workspaces look, look totally different. So this is what the default looks like. You have your tools over on the left here. You have your color and your layers over here. And you have your brushes down at the bottom on the right side. All right. Um, and then there is also a different one for animation which is made so that you can have your keyframes. You have a palette instead of the um, color wheel that we had earlier. You still have your layers down here. And then at the top, you have your tools. There is a similar one for uh, storyboarding, although that one's even more simple because that one isn't really designed for, they're assuming you're probably not using a lot of color with, with your storyboarding, so that disappears altogether except at the very top. So yes, so anyway, there's lots of different options, whatever works for you. Uh, this is minimal, this is really good if you are just beginning and you don't want as much clutter. Um, the one that I am using today is the VFX paint. It's slightly closer to Photoshop, so <laughs> I'm slightly more familiar with it, I'm a little bit more comfortable with it. So we're going to take a look at the desktop and where everything is. I know some of you are very familiar with digital art, so this is going to be kind of a recap, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so down over on the left hand side, uh, the bottom corner, you'll see we have layers. Now layers are basically like onion skin. So you have the background layer, which is this nice warm gray we've got, bluey gray here uh, that we have. And then we have a blank layer that it was automatically generated with this paint layer one right there. Now, if I want to make another layer, I will hit the plus right here. And if I want to delete a layer it's selected, I will just hit the garbage can right there. Very, very simple. The opacity of the layer, which is how much of an onion skin it is. If it's at 100%, it's, it's fully opaque. If it's lower than that, you get, you get less and less visibility, is controlled right here, right above the paint layers. Uh, and we'll talk about that briefly too. Uh, directly above that, you will have the tool options. You have a lot of brushes in Krita. One of the nicest things about Krita is how good their brushes are. I just have default brushes in here. They're all really great. Uh, if you ever want to waste an hour, play around with brushes in Krita. Um, they have some wonderful traditional art brushes that work so, so nicely. And then they also have some things that you would really only get in digital art. Uh, they have some stamps. They have a bunch of really nice pen pressure brushes, all sorts of things. They have screen tones. So definitely uh, play around with that. There are more brushes that you can get online for free that other people have made, but really you're going to want to start with what they have. So let's take a look at the brushes. So this is, as you can see here, there is a list of sort of categories. Now, if I want, I can actually make favorite brushes if there's something I always use. Um, but we have digital brushes, erasers. The eraser is a brush as far as this program is concerned. Uh, it's just going to be kind of connected to here. Um, and then there are ink, paint, pixel art, sketch, textures, um, and all sorts of things. So I'm going to actually look at textures for a moment because this is something you can't really do with traditional art. Uh, they have screen tones on here, which is really, really nice, and they are lots of fun to play with. Uh, so let's see a good example. So as you can see, as I'm drawing right here, uh, that is a screen tone, uh, and they have lots of different options, um, some of which, as you can see, are affected by the pressure that you are putting on your brush. So anyway, it's really fun. Um, if I want to change the color, I will actually go over to the right-hand side. There is that box. I'm sorry, I'm moving things out of the way because I have windows in the way. Even if I don't think, I hopefully you guys can't see them. We cannot. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. This was going to be very cluttered otherwise. Uh, so right over here, we you can select the color 
uh, right along here. And then um, the intensity uh, from very low intensity, a gray on this side to most intensity. And then at the top, you have the light and at the bottom, you have the dark. So yes, so you can move things around in here and then you can move around all around in here. And it's a little laggy because Krita does not particularly like, like Zoom very much, I don't think. But yeah, so, so here we have a nice blue. And you'll notice if I go over the screen tone, it doesn't, um, it doesn't like start blurring it out or anything. You end up, uh, the screen tone is even, even if you pick up your brush and then can draw over it, which is a really nice feature. Okay. All right. And so I'm just going to delete that because I don't really want it. I'll make a new layer. Now I could be working on the background. There's no reason I couldn't, but it's mostly force of habit to make an extra layer. And then you have, then you can at least change the background as needed. If you decide you want it to be a different color, for example. All right, does everything, does everything make sense to everybody? If you're confused about anything, you have to tell me. <laughs> um, so we're going to move up to the upper left-hand corner. This is where our tools are. Um, so as you can see right now, I have the brush selected. This is the freehand dress, brush tool. It's what you'll probably use most of the time if you are drawing. Uh, but there are other options. So I'm going to click and drag this down so you can see them. We've got the zoom tool down here. We've got gradients. We have selection tools right here. Those are the dot, dot, dots. Um, and then we also have the color, color sample tool, color picker, eyedropper, whatever you want to call it. Uh, which you can use if you are working on a piece that has a bunch of different colors and you want that color specifically without having to mess around with the color selector. Uh, we also have, there's shape tools, line tools, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, you can probably find click and drag, all sorts of stuff, whatever you need, you can do in here. But for now, we're really only going to be working with the freehand brush tool and maybe with the color sampler. All right, so I'm going to make that a little bit. Oh, also the text, the T is for text. Uh, Krita's text uh, options are not as robust as a lot of other places. Um, even Photoshop's is a little better. So just a heads up, it's not perfect, but they don't, they don't have quite as many options, but it is still there. All right. So then at the top here, we sort of have a summary. Uh, then we've got these, obviously we have the save, the undo, the redo, um, all sorts of things like that. But as you can see, we have the brush tool up there again, which I'm actually going to just switch it over to a more normal brush. We have the colors and you can actually flip, um, you have the foreground and background colors that you can switch between. We have gradients, we have the opacity of the brush, which we will be using and all sorts of things like that. Sorry, I have to move it so I can see all of it. Yeah, anyway, oh, and we also have the mirror tool, which is very fun, and we will talk about that. All right, so let's see. So for layers, um, as I briefly mentioned, these are the onion skin layers. They are very useful depending on what you are doing. Digital drawing will use a lot more layers than digital painting will. Obviously, this is going to be entirely dependent on what you want to be using. Uh, and we'll also get into that too. All right, uh, briefly, I wanna go over keyboard shortcuts. You do not have to use these. I don't tend to use them very much because, um, well, I'm usually drawing on this and I can't actually, and so I'd have to reach over and uh, pick up my pen and use the keyboard. Uh, but some quick options that are useful. Uh, the first, I'm going to just give you a little squiggle. Uh, the first is the mirror tool, which is you just hit M and it will flip your drawing. Now this is really useful if you have been working on the same project for a very long time and it starts to just look like nothing to you. Uh, flipping it you can makes you notice any imperfections that you wouldn't see otherwise. And then you just hit M again to uh, undo that. Uh, if you hit shift and hold it, and then click with your brush, you can actually change your brush size over in here. I'm not really sure why you would want to use it when you can just you change the brush size up at the top, 
but it's there. It's an option if you like. Um, the if you hit X, you will switch your foreground and background colors. So if you are, for example, this is my background color, um, and then I can hit X again, and I will get blue. Uh, so that is useful if it is uh, something you need to be doing. If you are switching between two two colors primarily, uh, that can be kind of a nice shortcut. Uh, beyond that, uh, most standard keyboard shortcuts work. Uh, control Z uh, for undo, Control C for copy, Control uh, V for paste, Control A select all. All of those work uh, just the same as they do with most other things. So if that's something you enjoy, you can actually go much more into that and have many, many, many more options. All right, so I'm going to pause there first. Oh, no, first one thing. Uh, I wanted to talk about the other mirroring option, uh, no, no relation to pressing M, which is actually really, really fun. So I'm going to mess with my brush size a little bit and opacity. So there is a horizontal mirror tool and a vertical mirror, mirror tool at the top of your screen. Now, what this does is, as you can see, the line that is now here. Anything you draw on one side of the screen, doesn't matter which, uh, will be mirrored on the other side. So for example, if I am drawing something on here, so we're just using a little pen tool, um, it will automatically show up on the other side. This can just be really fun to play with, um, especially if you are uh, working with a pattern or something that is perfectly symmetrical. So anyway, I just thought that would be uh, a, a fun thing. Definitely check it out. And then of course, the, uh, uh, the horizontal tool works the same way. So if you wanted, you can actually have them both on at once. And so you can have all sorts of interesting geometric shapes. All right, I'm going to turn off my uh, mirroring. There we go. All right, so that was the, um, mo I think most of the really basic, this is what is where. Uh, oh, transparency, that's also important. I'm gonna do it briefly to talk about transparency. Um, so transparency uh, is uh, how you affect the opacity, both in the layers and in the brush. It can be either one. So I'm going to actually do, do some examples for you so you can see how it works. Now, different brushes have different levels of pen pressure. So if you are drawing, the harder you press, the, and then lighter and then darker again, uh, so that also affects the opacity. That's not what we're really talking about here, but it is a nice feature of, of a lot of brushes. So definitely something to uh, look at and figure out. So you can have a low opacity in the layer or you can have it in the uh, uh, on your brush tool. Now, I mean, or you could do both, I guess, but so we are gonna play with or play around with that for a bit. So right now I have full opacity on my brush tool and full opacity on my layer tool. And I'm gonna just draw us a little ghosty for our example. This is not the best brush for this. I should probably switch over to this brush. There we go. So, okay, so we got a little ghosty. Krita is very laggy at the moment. So I apologize if things are kind of bouncing around a bit. But so we have our, <laughs> it's been a while since Halloween, guys. Uh, it's uh, a little ghosty here. And if I affect the, uh, I can change the layers opacity and make it lighter. As you can see, it's at 49%, and you can see that line has gotten a lot lighter. Now I can, of course, change this back. Um, 
And, but if you are doing a brush, you're not gonna be able to change it back. So let's see. So we have opacity 100% over here. And then I'm gonna go up to the top and I am going to lower the opacity of the brush. I'm also gonna make this bigger so you can see it. And so while this may look like the brush is simply just kind of a light gray, this is actually would be much more of a white. So if this was at opacity 100%, that's what it would look like. Kelsey, would you be able to move the window back up? We are having the bottom cut off a little bit. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Can you see now? Perfect. <laughs> All right. I, I am going to have to bounce it around a little bit just so that I can see my, my toolbar. There we go. And then you can actually continue going over this and make it lighter or darker. Um, basically, you are just adding layers. And every time you lift your brush, you are then going to be making another layer. And you may notice that this layer is underneath the other one. Um, now, if I was to move this, I could switch it. And then it, so if whichever layer is on top of the list right over here at the bottom corner, uh, it is also the layer that is visually first for you. So that's simplifying things a little bit, but there you go. All right. So that was just a quick example of how you can kind of play around with opacity. Now, obviously, everybody's workflow is going to be different. Whatever works for you works for you. But um, generally speaking, what I have seen is, is that if you are drawing digitally, you are going to be using multiple layers. Uh, you will be using your, your, you'll be using your eraser and you will be messing around more with layer opacity than you will brush opacity um, because you will be building up those layers over here instead of on the, the canvas itself. Whereas for digital painting, you will likely not be using that many layers. If any, you may be just painting on the original layer. And uh, uh, likewise, you probably won't be doing very much erasing. Instead, you will just be painting on top of it. And you will be messing around with your brush opacity a bit more. So you may be using very, very light opacity and then just building it up as you work. So I'm going to pull up some examples. Uh, this is from my own work, a lot of it is very, very old because I had to find examples of all of these. And they are, it is in Photoshop because I started in Photoshop and I am most familiar with it. However, the reason why this is an introduction to Krita and not Photoshop is that I cannot in all good conscience recommend people uh, subs uh, get a subscription to Adobe Creative Suite uh, for a number of reasons. And also because Adobe Photoshop Elements 8 is not, I believe, for sale anymore. It's very, very old. It came with my tablet. <laughs> All right, so let's look at some examples. Did you guys see the screen switch? That's, I suppose that's an important question. All right. Yes, it's good. Okay, good. Um, so we have, uh, this is Adobe Photoshop. As you can see, this is also very simplified and the symbols that you that you will see in Krita are the same here, the same just about everywhere. You have your toolbar over on the left hand side. You have the color picker at the bottom, and then you have the layers here. Now this was done all on one layer, so it, and it um, because it was a quick study, and I didn't, and so this was done originally on the background layer. Uh, this was from a photo. Let me find a good example of a using lots. Okay, so I have an example of something that used a bunch of layers that was more traditional digital drawing. It's from back in college and it is, has way too many layers. So it's a good example of what the problem with working with a lot of layers is. Now, admittedly for Photoshop elements, um, they do not give you an option to make a folder for your layers, which makes it much harder to keep track of what belongs to what. Uh, later versions of this fix that problem. Um, so this was from a women in mythology uh, assignment. Let me see. So this was, this has some pitfalls for you. Um, the, so as you can see on the right hand side, there are lots of layers, <laughs> um, so many layers. 
uh, because I was trying very hard to be organized and I wanted to be able to go back and change colors as I moved around and decided I wanted to move things. So we have at the very top, probably, yes, at the very top, we have line art. I did actually name some of these uh, uh, files. And then we have all for almost every single color and all of the shading, they had their own layers. Uh, this was, this did get out a little out of hand. Um, so we would have a layer for the fire effect and then another layer for, that would take out the fire background and so on and so forth. So all manner of details. That one, that one was actually the details specific. Uh, and so, yes, so this, this is kind of an extreme example of what, what uh, the layer option can do. You can have every individual thing uh, have its own layer. Unfortunately, the downside of this is that uh, it's really, really hard to keep straight. You're going to draw on the wrong layer and it will make you crazy. Um, this is also, this also has a good example of uh, the pitfalls of zooming in. One of the really nice things about digital art versus traditional art is, is that you can zoom in and work really, really small on a little thing and get a lot of detail packed in without like sitting there with a magnifying glass. Uh, the downside of this is that the smaller you work, you have to keep in mind the big picture. So for example, this is a case of me not doing that. Uh, never ever work at a larger magnitude than 100%. So if you can see right here up in the uh, left-hand corner, the there it says 13%. Uh, there's also options for zooming to fit screen. Uh, the one-to-one -one is the uh, is like the absolute biggest. Now this was also this file was also huge. This is a 16 inches by 23 inches, and it's 300 pixels per inch. So the problem is, is if you work at, I would recommend usually if you are working at si various sizes to work at 50% or 67%, don't work at 100%, definitely don't work at 200%, because if you do, you will end up putting so much detail into a, sp a space and nobody is going to see it. So that's it at 100%. As you can see, I was doing a bunch of little details. And unfortunately, those details really don't survive at a larger le level. Same with the jewelry and various things like that. It was very fun to do. It didn't really trans translate visually. So that is just a side note on these things. All right. Um, so yes, so that is the kind of thing that you will get a lot of with um, uh, digital art. Uh, that is done in digital drawing style. Now for uh, digital painting, you're going to get a very different effect. You're probably going to be working on only a couple layers, as I mentioned before. Um, so let me see, here is a good example. Okay, so this is, an un this is not a completed drawing. Oop, there's a message in the chat. <laughs> All right, have a good day, Jamie. Um, so this is an incomplete um, uh, digital painting. It is actually based on a college friend of mine. Uh, she made this, she made the, um, uh, she does costume design. And so, and I said, hey, I need to practice drawing feathers and gems. Can I use this, this photo as a reference? And she said, yes. So this, as you can see, does not have nearly as many layers. Uh, there is the background layer, which I just left as white. I wasn't sure it, if I wanted to keep wh what kind of background I wanted. So I also have this charcoal one, but I made sure it's not the background layer so that I could easily change it. And then there is the main one. And then there is a sketch layer, which is currently not visible. And then I also have at the very top, my reference photo. So the reference photo is right here. This is really useful if you are working from references to have it on its own layer that you can kind of toggle on and off to double check to make sure you're not too far off. And then the sketch layer is right here. Let's make it a little bit more visible. So this was a very quick sketch that I did at the beginning. Um, 
and then would, and then I decided to start painting. So, and it's actually, you can see it can overlay the original, but this is all on the same layer. The reason why it is all on the same layer is because if you want good blending and if you want to really work colors up, the best way to do it is, is on just one or two layers. So for example, I'm going to zoom in again a bit because I don't learn my lesson and I do work in more than 100%. Uh, so right over here is a thing that I was actually a little bit farther along with. And as you can see, I'm, I have all sorts of different colors here. I was working at a bunch of different opacity levels um, and different colors. And because I am all on the same layer, I can, I can really smoosh those colors together just like you would if you were painting. The difference between if you were painting traditionally is that after a certain point, you end up having to scrape the paint off because it's this thick, which is not something you have to worry about with digital art. You just go straight over it. All right. So yes, and so there's no erasing on this because it's all on the same layer. So if I erase this, you would just get that charcoal. So instead, you just paint over it if you want to change anything. All right. So digital versus traditional art, I have briefly talked about it a little bit, some of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, the, big, the big advantage for digital art is that you do not end up with a mess. Um, oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, that if you... Uh, you don't have to worry about knocking over your inkwell onto your almost completed drawing. That's a very specific example because it happened to me three times. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about things like that. The trade-off, however, is you have to worry about saving your files because you do not want to have worked on something for five hours and then have your computer crash. So do not trust autosave. Uh, Krita has it. Pretty much any program has autosave. Don't trust it. Don't believe it. It is lies. Uh, you really, really don't want to find out the hard way that something didn't save. So what you want to do, I'm going to switch back to Krita. Uh, so what you want to do is save early, save often, um, save pretty much near the beginning. As soon as you have something, you go, okay, yeah, I want to keep this. I want to keep working on this. You save it. And then periodically, you really just have to get it into the habit of save it again, save it again, save it again, uh, whenever you have a moment. Uh, because yes, the autosave will try to help you, but it does not always succeed. And sometimes your drawing program will crash and sometimes your computer will crash. All sorts of things can go wrong. You really wanna save it. You wanna back it up if you can. Um, that is very, very important. You will lose so much stuff otherwise. Sorry, I'm gonna lose my voice. Uh, so you can also um, combine digital art and traditional art. People do it all the time. Uh, you can scan a document into your computer and then use it traditionally. Uh, Krita actually is really nice. It has an option specifically for removing backgrounds. Uh, it makes it transparent. Uh, it's filter color to alpha if you're, if you're wondering, and that will take out the paper background. It's not perfect, but it does. It is really nice. Um, so you can always work on things like that. If you want, if you have a sketch that you want to uh, put directly into the into Krita, you can do that. Uh, vice versa, if for example you do line art and then you print it out and do and work on it traditionally, that is also a thing you can do. You, you can really mesh them together, and it could be really nice. Um, Let's see some other things. Uh, so some common problems with Krita in particular is it is very laggy sometimes. Um, let's see, uh, I should probably be drawing while I talk, shouldn't I? Uh, give you some examples of, of, what, I, of what I'm talking about here. So Krita is, does have a slowness problem. Uh, it's not all the time, but sometimes Krita just, really, really does not want to work. When that happens, your best bet is turn it off, turn it on again. Just same as anything else, exit out of it, go back in. It'll probably be fine. Sorry, I'm messing with my brush sizes again. Uh, 
but uh, yes, um, there is also a bunch of information on the uh, Krita.org. They have lots of suggestions. If for some reason something isn't working, or if it's really, really slow, and you've done also, you've tried everything, you've looked at your file size, and it's not like, you know, three feet by uh, by seven feet, and it's not a billion uh, pixels per inch. Um, and you've looked at all that and you know you're totally reasonable and for some reason it's still not right go to created um, created.org they have lots of suggestions and you can really just really just have to kind of start going down the list and checking and you'll figure out what's what's causing the slowdown um, mostly that happens because Krita has so many options it can um, that it can just take up a lot of space so um I wrote, I have notes right here and it just says save your files like three times. <laughs> so let's also talk about those files. Um, so your working file will be um, a Krita, it's K-R-A. So let me actually, so if I was going to save as, um, so yes, so we have our in progress, you can title it whatever you want. As you can see here, it says Krita document. Dot kra. Now this is your working file. Uh, in Photoshop, it would be a PSD. If you're working in GIMP, it would be XCF. Um, the working file has all of the layers that you're using, if you have them. It's got um, pretty much everything that you save. Now you always want to have this, um, but when it is a big file. So when you are uploading it, if you are uh, putting it on the internet, you're going to want to make a smaller file that doesn't have all of these layers. And for that, you really have a couple options. Um, you can save it as a JPEG, which will give you a very small file comparatively, uh, but it will be slightly lower quality. Uh, you also have the option, here, if you can see here, there are all sorts of options down here, including Photoshop image. Yes, you can actually switch between Krita and Photoshop. Um, but yes, so there is all sorts of options right here. And um, a PNG, uh, a GIF, um, BMP, you get a much a higher quality. It's going to be a bigger file, though. So depending on what you are putting it up, uh, where you're putting it up, and how good your internet is, um, that is always something to consider. All right. So yes, but you do want to keep the KR, the, the, the Krita file, your working file, because if you want to make any changes, that's where you're going to be working. Uh, because otherwise you're just, you just have the final flattened version, which has all of the layers just flat. Obviously this doesn't actually have any layers, but you get what I'm saying. All right, let me see. So do you have any questions? Anything you guys want me to go over more? Anything that you particularly are working on? Uh, I saw somebody in the chat earlier was mentioned that you were doing um, design work, uh, graphic design, illustration, green cards. And it, you mentioned it's a little di difficult to use di do digital art versus by hand for sure. Yes, it is. Um, it's a bit of an adjustment. For me, the biggest adjustment was because I have my glorified trackpad here is that I can't look at where my, what my hand is doing. I have to look at the screen. Now, there are obviously newer versions of this where you can actually look down and look at your uh, trackpad tablet, but um, this is old. It works and it, it really just was a matter of getting used to it and getting comfortable with it. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. So they're kind of unrelated questions. Uh, I guess the first one since you're on Krita is, I think you called it the filter color to alpha. Yes. So I'm wondering where that would be located. Oh, yes, let me show you that actually. That's really, um, well, that should be, so right up at the top of your screen at the very top of the bar, there is a filter option. And all you're really going to want to do is, um, just there is a color to alpha. Let me see if I can find it. I think it might have been under colors. Under colors? Oh yeah, color to alpha. There it is. Okay. 
Um, so yes, this is, this is the color to alpha and you can use this. There's the color sampler. So you'll probably want to do white. You can, uh, the threshold basically is how, um, how much, how much it's going to be, uh, how sensitive it is. So the higher the threshold is, the more sensitive it is. I may have switched that around in my head. Um, but yes, so this is what you would use if you had scanned in a document, you can use it and it will just set the white as transparent. And transparent always looks like those gray checks. Um, but if you, uh, but the, those, those won't be in the completed version. So when you flatten it, that, that'll just be clear. All right, what was your other question? So this one, I guess, might be a little bigger of a question. So when um, the one when you were showing the layer of your sorry, when you were showing the sketch you were doing of your friend, um, do you have any tips for sketching before you actually start on the painting or illustration? Like even just this flower here? Uh, yeah, so in this case, let me switch over to that. OK, um, so in this case, this was this is sort of uh, a pet project that whenever I don't want to be working on things I'm supposed to, I come over here and we'll practice this because I can kind of turn my brain off. Um, so the original sketch is, as you can see, it's really, really loose. I really just wanted to make sure that I had uh, her face in the right spot and I was working very closely with the photograph to try and keep everything. But as you can see, like right here, this is not, at all right here on the um on the on the necklace it's i was really more interested in getting the silhouette than i was on being actually accurate um so after that point basically what i did was i started just blocking in with bigs with a big big splotchy brush blocking in where things were and then getting more and more specific as i went along which you can still see uh, with the rest of it because there are all these parts where I really haven't done very much. So for example, the hair is still kind of a mess. And then we all have these feathers up here, which I really, uh, which I was mostly interested in putting the color down and putting it so that I would know what I was trying to do and where I was trying to go with it without doing actual detail. And so this was originally like that too. There was just like, there'd be like a green splotch where there was supposed to be a, a gem. And then I would go back through, add some, add some highlights, add some, and just kind of keep building up the color. Uh, the thing about digital painting in particular is that uh, it spends probably the first 80% of it looking absolutely terrible. The, uh, and then you get a 10% and it's like, oh, okay, this starts to look like something. And then the last 10%, is, it looks great, but it takes a really long time to actually hit the point where it's like, oh, that's what this is supposed to be. So um, uh, poor Alexa spent a lot of time kind of looking like Slenderman because she didn't have facial features. And then I eventually was like, okay, this looks awful. I gotta, I gotta go actually spend some time on that. Uh, let's see some more examples. I did actually have a couple. Um, okay, so this is an example of some fun stuff you can do with filters. Um, this was a digital drawing thing that was much more simpler. I have learned my lesson from the previous projects and I don't do quite as many layers anymore. And so I really wanted to play around with wood grain uh, 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 textures. So what I have here, I can just, so the background is a, um, uh, is it's not a solid color. It is more of a uh, gradient. And then I added this wood grain texture, which was actually from Photoshop. And this, this other layer, the, the one that's called layer 16, as you can see, I delete a lot of layers as I go, um, is just the exact same thing, just darker. Um, and the reason why I have two of those was because this is the color layer and it sits on top of it. So as you can see, there's still a, a certain amount of painting that was kind of going on here, but I kept all of the color on its own layer. And then when I put this on top of it, then you get that darker um, wood grain effect, but it means that the background is still darker in comparison. And then of course you have the line art that is on sitting on top of the whole thing. So it's not affected by it. 
So yeah, anyway, that's that's just a quick example of some of the things you can do um, with the different layers. And let's see, last example. This is, was another portrait, a uh, different friend um, who I asked her if I could use, uh, use her as a study. And so this was an example of why you don't want to be working on your background. I mean, you can, but if you are indecisive, you don't want to be working on your background because I couldn't decide what I wanted the background to look like. And before I put this neutral gray, it actually looked like this. So that's the original background. And then I added another layer in because I was like, this is a little too loud and it's not going to affect my main uh, subject because she's on her own layer. Make sense? All right, any other questions? Somebody in chat. Thanks. Hey, I'm glad. But yes, the the big thing with digital painting or digital drawing or really anything is you just have to kind of keep working at it. I am most comfortable with Photoshop because it's where I started and I've put so many hours into it. It's not the best program. Krita actually has so many more options, um, but because I have spent so much time with it, I'm kind of stuck with it, though I am certainly trying and learning as I go with Krita. All right, and we are, this is actually the first of a quarterly series we are going to be doing. Um, probably we will be continuing them in Zoom, and though we may do some in person depending on what the program is, so we will be doing more in the future. I will probably not be the one running it, we will probably have guest speakers, which will be very nice. And I'm very much looking forward to it. So if you have, if any of you have any suggestions for us, I would really appreciate it. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to spend some time doodling. If you have any more questions, uh, you can just uh, kind of hang out until uh, 7.30 when we're officially done. Kelsey, would you be able to share some of the resources that they can oh, yes, um, yes. find for Krita or perhaps a suggestion of a tablet they can use? Okay, yeah. Um, so again, I'm using a Wacom Bamboo tablet. It's super simple. It's uh, It works great. Obviously, it's survived and, uh, and it still works just fine. Um, I don't think they still sell Wacom Bamboo tablets, but they've got Cintiqs. They've got all sorts of things. Um, Again, there are some really nice options out there, especially if you want to be able to uh, look at the tablet and draw. Uh, really, the only thing that's really important is making sure that you have good tablet sensitivity. Oh, speaking of which, I'm not actually sure if this is visible, but uh, I always have my touch. Uh, uh, I always have my touch off when I am drawing because I am left-handed, and so I drag my hand across the tablet. So if I have the touch turned on. I get weird marks all over the place. So if you are left-handed, that is always something to consider. They do actually have a lefty setup versus right-handed setup. So, um, which is why the buttons for this are on my left side instead of my right. So that's always a useful feature. Um, what but, is your favorite oh, feature of Krita? Um, oh, well, I really like the brushes. The brushes are so nice. They've got so many cool options in there. And again, if you want to, you know, spend, spend an hour uh, messing around with that, that's, it's, it's an hour well spent. Um, uh, and I'm also actually really excited about their animation options because I don't really animate very much. Um, but the fact that they have all of those options for keyframes makes me kind of want to. And let's see, yes. Um, so if you want, I highly, also highly recommend going on krita.org. They have all sorts of tutorials and all sorts, of, they, they really have some really nice step-by-step. -step. It's also just got a really good community. Um, so if you are wanting to uh, learn, some, learn some new things, if you have a specific question, that is the place to go. And also if you want to work on your tutorial. Uh, work on some tutorials. Uh, oh, also YouTube. YouTube actually, there's a lot of uh, Krita tutorials on there, and there are also a lot of speed paints, which can be really useful. So if you look up 
say, for example, if you have a particular art style that you quite like, looking up a speed paint that somebody does if they're using Krita can really get you a little bit more familiar. If it's okay to share, do you have a site or social media we could check out your other art on? Uh, <laughs> not at the moment. I actually, I used to have a carbon made portfolio, but they, um, uh, they, they, they went under. I have a very, very old deviant art somewhere. Don't, don't, don't look that up. <laughs> um, but yes, so at the moment, I'm afraid I do not have any uh, public um, art portfolios up anymore. But, but you are welcome to check out the Sycamore Library YouTube page. We do um, other, we've done some other art things. We've done some craft things. Uh, yes, Carbonade was actually really nice while it lasted, but about a year ago, they switched over to paid only. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. So it looks like the questions have been asked. And then everybody, thank you so much for coming. Um, this was Kelsey's first Zoom she was hosting and she did a wonderful job. And I'm so excited to see what her next artist program is going to be. All right. And I really hope to see you at the, at the next one, whatever it is. And then we also, uh, Sam, we have a artist in residence program in July, yes, with Jan Bollinger, which will be very interesting. And that will be an in-person event at the Sycamore Public Library. Correct, yep. And we'll have our newsletter will be published online for anybody that is not a official Sycamore resident and is interested in attending. We do have a lot of virtual programs as well. So if you're not in the area, we still try to make it accessible to all. Um, just as our library is, everything's free to anybody that comes in. Every program is free to participate. We also have coming up our summer reading challenge starting on Monday, May 23rd, going through July 25th. Anybody, anyone, I mean, you can sign up. You do not need to be a Sycamore resident. You do not need to have a Sycamore card. We have a lot of fun. I have some great grand prizes. If you don't live in the area and win a grand prize, I would happily ship it to you. Yes, the prizes are really good. I, I took a look at them earlier. They're great. I'm very jealous, in fact. Staff members can't participate. <laughs> Actually from Rhode Island, welcome. I don't know how you got here, but welcome. <laughs> Yes, but yeah, you are, you're always welcome. We're happy to have people um, uh, participate with in our online things. And of course, if you are ever in Illinois, we will be happy to see you. Thank you, Kelsey. All right, have a great night and I will see you next time. Thank you.